Uh, next up on the agenda, we have Mark Perkins. Uh, this is a sponsor talk from Element. Uh, Mark is Senior Application Chemist and SIFT MS Specialist, and the talk title is Selected Ion Flow Tube Mass Spectrometry as a Simple Approach to Breath Analysis. After graduating from the University of Southampton uh, with a degree in chemistry, uh, followed on doing a PhD in electrochemistry, joined Anatune in April 2015 in the role of application chemist, where he became a product specialist for a new range of SIFT MS products. Anatune has now become a part of Element Materials Technology. Over to Mark. Thanks. Hello, I'm Mark Perkins from Element Cambridge Life Sciences, formerly Anatune, and I'm going to talk to you today about selected ion flow tube mass spectrometry as a simple approach to breath analysis. So earlier this year, um, we teamed up with Alstone Medical and the Functional Gut Clinic to take our SIFTMS to the British Society of Gastroenterology Live 22 conference to demonstrate live breath analysis. So Here's a picture of us at the conference, and you can see here in the middle our SIFT MS, which we had set up as a working instrument to do a breath analysis on anybody who was interested in finding out what they were breathing out. So, what we're interested in, or particularly the functional gut clinic are interested in, is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, I'm no expert on breath analysis, so this is what I've gleaned from Wikipedia, and it seems that measuring hydrogen and methane gas, as well as hydrogen sulfide, is a good marker for potential SIBO. So what we did was we set up a method that would look for methane and hydrogen sulfide, amongst some other analytes. We can't see hydrogen. And what we were looking for to see if we could actually do real-time, swift measurement of these analytes to potentially detect the presence of SIBO in people. So the first thing I'm going to say is how does SIFTMS work? So SIFTMS is a real-time gas phase analyzer. And it works by uh, soft chemical ionization from a number of reagent ions reacting with your analyte to produce some ionized species. So the first thing, the uh, reagent ions are generated from a microwave plasma of, of moist air. And we get a range of analytes, both positive and negative. And what we do with these analytes is they pass through a first quadrupole mass filter where we select one of the reagent ions. And this quadrupole mass filter can switch reagent ions very quickly. So we always get a beam of one reagent ion going into the flow tube, but we can switch them very fast. So the reagent ions enter the flow tube, and the flow tube is a carrier gas and also the sample inlet. So our analyte comes in from the sample inlet, and the analyte reacts with the reagent ion uh, at some reaction rate K to form some product ions or product ions. So depending on the analyte and the reagent ion, we will get different product ions reacting at a different reaction rate K. It takes about five milliseconds in the flow tube for this to happen and passed on to a second quadrupole mass filter and particle multiplier to actually count everything up and do the, the detection. So if we count the product ions, the remaining reagent ions, which are always in excess, and we multiply it by the, the, the reaction rate K, we get a direct quantitative measurement of analyte concentrations. So this method is inherently quantitative. And so we can build methods that can quantitate a range of VOCs and give you the output in real time immediately. So here's an example of, of, of the sort of plots you get. So this is um, a coffee bean being roasted. And as it gets hot, it cracks and it releases some compounds. And you can see over time on the x-axis, we get concentration changes. And this is the sort of plot we will get for a system S profile. We pick down the lights, we measure the concentration over time, and you get these plots coming out. So it is amenable to a wide range of analytes. So almost all VOCs will be detected by, by SIFT-MS, including a number of the inorganics such as ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon dioxide, etc. So it's, it is amenable to a wide range of analytes. As long as you're in the gas phase, we can actually analyze for them. The other thing to say, which we'll see is important later, is it not only is it very sensitive, it has a wide dynamic range. So here we've got a plot of two analytes, 1,3-butadiene and benzene, being delivered to the, the instrument, being measured at 30 parts per trillion by volume for butadiene, 15 parts per billion by benzene. And about 60 seconds, the benzene concentrations increased about 2,000 fold. And you can see we get the measured increase of the benzene with no effect on the butadiene concentration. So we now have six orders of magnitude between these two analytes. So you can clearly see that having high concentrations of one analyte does not affect the concentration of others within that method. And this is very important when we see the data sets going forward. 
So that, I've, obviously, I've got a very short period of time to talk about this. So that's a very brief introduction to SIFDMS. If you would like to know more, then visit the SIF Technologies uh, website at www.sif.com and look for this webinar. They have a number of webinars on their, their, their website and they are very useful to introduce the technique and give you much, much more information about how the technique works and some of the applications that are available. So in the setup we used at the, um, the conference, we basically had a very simple swage lock fitting where we had an inlet which we asked the person to put a straw against and they would breathe into the straw and any excess flow would flow out of the back of the instrument. But the required inlet flow at 25 mils per minute would be taken into the inlet and taken down to the instrument and sampled. We also had a clean nitrogen flow that flowed into the instrument that when people were breathing, obviously it cut the flow off, but when they weren't breathing, nitrogen flow flowed through the inlet and kept everything clean. So we had a clean background running through the instrument at all times and it meant that if you were breathing into the instrument, the instrument would sample it and we would get some breath responses. So let's have a look at what we saw for breath profiles. So here's an example of breath profile of six analytes we were interested in. So acetic acid, acetone, ammonia, butanoic acid, hydrogen sulfide and methane. And you can see that methane is actually at significantly higher levels. The um, concentration axis is in parts per billion by volume. So the methane is clearly in there at, at, at several tens of parts per million. One of the reasons we put acetone into this test as well was because acetone is, is always on people's breath. So it's a good marker of the breath phase. So you can see here that this is the actual breath phase of the, of, of the, the person breathing into it. So we measure concentrations in this part of that profile. So we take the methane out, so we look at some of the lower compounds. You can see here that you've got the acetone level there at around about 1.2 ppm, but we've still got things like acetic acid, butanoic acid and hydrogen sulfide, one of the analytes we're really interested in, at very low levels. So again, there's your breath phase marked off by the acetone. Now, of course, plot this as a, a log plot. And if we just plot it as a log plot, you can see here all of the analytes are there to be detected. So butanoic acid, hydrogen sulfide down at single figure parts per billion um, in the presence of methane at several tens of parts per million. So you can see why uh, the ability to have this wide dynamic range, as, as, as discussed earlier, is really important for this type of analysis because we've got four orders of magnitude between these two concentrations for these analytes. And we're interested in the methane and we're interested in the hydrogen sulfide. So again, this is the breath phase. And what we will do is obviously take the average concentration for an analyte, for example, here, the acetic acid, and then that would be the concentration in breath for those analytes. So we can see here for this profile here, these are the measured concentrations for that breath profile. So obviously over the three days of the conference, people came up and breathed into the instrument and we got a whole range of data. And here's basically some of it. I'm not going to ask you to look at it, but you can see we can generate a lot of data very, very quickly, really, really straightforwardly. One thing to say at this point, of course, is what's the limits of detection and background for these analytes? So here is the, uh, the background levels and limits of detection in parts per billion by volume for the analytes we're interested in. And you can see that uh, for the likes of hydrogen sulfide, butanoic acid, our limits of detection are sub one part per billion. Methane, the limits of detection are, are much higher, but then we're expecting to see methane at levels in the uh, several parts per million, if not 10 parts per million. So that limit of detection is not a, a problem for this type of analysis. So just to plot that data set out um, here, you can see this is a complete data set. You can see you've got the methane at high levels at the back and all the other analytes at the front. Note this high acetone level here. This was interesting. The person who breathed into this um, actually said that he was on a ketogenic diet. <clears throat> and you can see that clearly he's producing significant levels of acetone versus everybody else. If we take away the methane, um, we get to see some of the lower profile compounds. Again, there's your high acetone level from um, from the, the, the person on the ketogenic diet. And you can see the ammonia levels behind. But even now, the compounds of interest, the small fatty acids and the hydrogen sulfide are still sitting in the baseline of this uh, uh, of, of this data set. So again, we move, remove the, um, the acetone in the ammonia and we end up with the low level compounds here. So acetic acid at the back, the butanoic acid in yellow and the hydrogen sulfide down in the single figure parts per billion by volume at the front of the, the, the profile. So um, you can see that we can detect these compounds at very different concentration ranges for a very, very straightforward, less than one minute breath analysis. 
let's just put the methane versus the hydrogen sulfide because obviously we we're interested in 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 SIBO and these are the two markers and here I've plotted the hydrogen sulfide in parts per billion the methane in this plot is in parts per million so there is significant three orders of magnitude difference between the two of them now I'm not in any way able to make any you know a statement about the correlations between these these two compounds are I'm not a breath scientist this is what you at the you know the, the breath biopsy conference know about I'm the analytical chemist that that, that, that uses SIFTMS but what I wanted to demonstrate here was that um, we could take an instrument to a conference set it up work in mass spec and get people to come up to the stand and in one minute analyze their breath for compounds like methane and hydrogen sulfide and the small fatty acids at very different concentration ranges and get workable and usable data sets to look at uh, these breath profiles. So this is a very, very brief overview of, of, of SIFTMS and what we did it did with it at the um, BSG conference in June in Birmingham. So with that, I'd like any questions you have and thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank you. I can. <clears throat> can you see me? Yeah, I can see and hear Brilliant. you. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so we've got time for a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, first question here, uh, does water affect the measurement? Obviously, breath is a very uh, human metric. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, no, I mean, the interesting thing about um, SIFTMS as a technique is that water doesn't actually affect the, the, the way the technique works. In fact, there are some effects that water has on things like the reagent iron, production and also on the ultimate product ions in the sense that water can cluster around some of the, 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 the product ions that are formed. But because we understand the processes and how they work, we feed that information into our library, which underpins the calculations. And so we look for all of the water chemistry that may affect some of the results and use that information and feed it into the final results. So obviously you can't put liquid water into the instrument, but you know, breath, breath um, humidity is, is not a problem for SIFTMS at all. It actually handles water very, very effectively. That's great, thanks. So it's obviously a very fast instrument, you know, great dynamic range, a library of different compounds in there. One of the questions that's come through is, is, is there a limit to the number of compounds that you could look for or any other types of limitations? Um, in theory, no, in the sense that if you have the um, information for the the product ion outputs for those, those compounds, you can just keep adding them into the method. But of course, you have a finite dwell time you need for, for detection of those, those analytes. So the more analytes you stick into your method, the, the longer, either the longer the, the, the gap between each data point is, or you get a little bit more noise because you're dwelling on those product ions for shorter periods of time. So you feed a bit more noise into the signal. But theoretically, you can run as many as you like. I've run methods with 20 to 30 compounds in. Now, there are some questions about conflicts in that. So the more compounds you add in, of course, this is essentially doing separation by, by two mass specs. So there's no chromatographic separation. So you have to be sure that your product ions are unique. Now, that's never going to be the case in all cases. There are going to be some crossovers, but often we can separate that out mm -hmm. using the product ion, um, reagent ion chemistry. So... In theory, no, but there are, like any method, some technical limitations, but often you don't bump into it unless you're looking for massive data sets, basically. Yeah, yeah. There's a question come in. I think you've basically captured it there, saying without separation, are there interfering product ions that could impact quantitation of the targets in a company yeah, like Yeah, there are. I mean, obviously, there's certain ways to look at this. So, for example, things like um, uh, positional isomers, we really can't separate. So xylenes, you can never separate them. But as you get into sort of more structural isomerism, there is some more separation available to you. And things like um, functional isomerism, so things like as, um, ketones versus aldehydes, absolutely separatable, even though they're the same mass, you know, because they're isomers, but we can separate them based on the functional chemistries of it. So it is dependent on what you're looking for, really. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, thanks, Mark. Is there a regular update to the SIFT library to include more compounds? Um, not often. I mean, the library is relatively comprehensive in the sense it has about 1,500 compounds in it, which sort of covers quite a few of those small volatile compounds you're interested in. There are periodic updates. So a few years ago, the instrument 
we used to operate only in positive eye mode. Now we could do it in both positive and negative eye mode. And there was quite a significant library update to grab some negative iron data and some more compounds added. But it doesn't happen very often. But adding new compounds to the library is a relatively trivial thing mm -hmm. if you have access to that compound in the first instance. So you've got a standard. It's just a case of grabbing the product iron data, working out the kinetics, which are actually quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't happen very often, I'll be honest with you. It's not like a annual NIST library update because mm -hmm. it's obviously a much smaller group of people working on this. So <laughs> we don't have as much input. Yeah, I suppose it'd be interesting to have a subset of you know compounds yeah. that are commonly found on breath. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be quite. Yeah, interesting. I think I mean it'd be interesting to worth looking at that, and maybe within the community to come up with something like that. You curate your own library, and then within the community, you can share any 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 updates that you have. Mm -hmm. Because we try to be comprehensive in the library, but of course we never can be, and it's very sort of you know um, area dependent, really. Fantastic. Uh, next question. Are there other methods of delivering breath to the instrument of direct analysis as possible? I think this is interesting because obviously a lot of the times when you're running a clinical study, um, you know, you couldn't necessarily put 10 instruments in 10 different sites. Um, so is there a way to capture sample and bring it to the instrument? Yeah. So, I mean, the most obvious way is within bags. So, you know, Tedlar bags or some other, you know, bag you know, option, and we can just attach the bag to the front end of the instrument, samples it in exactly the same way, just pulls some sample through and gives you the results. Of course, there's a fairly, fairly limited time involved in the bag analysis. The other option we have is that we can also add automation on top of these instruments. So we put sort of XYZ robots on top of it, particularly the Gerstle MPS platform. And what we've been able to do is using their thermal desorption system is actually enable us to do thermal desorption into the instrument. So we can take TD tubes, directly desorb them through the instrument and get real-time desorption profiles for stuff captured on thermal desorption tubes. And the, the benefit from that is it's actually a much faster technique than doing it with GC because when you're desorbing, you're getting your results. So once you've desorbed the tube, you move on to the next one and then you move on to the next one. We can get like throughputs of the tube every four to five minutes on, on thermal desorption. So there are op other options available. Just for either capture the breath in in its sort of native state or trap it onto a solvent and then release it in that way would be the two other options, I would say. Brilliant, thanks. Um, next question is, was the volume and flow rate of the sample constant? Yes, yeah, so the inlet of the instrument is, the flow of the instrument is controlled by a, a, a restriction capillary that limits the flow through the instrument to a fixed volume per you know, flow rate. So it's about 25 mils per minute. The reason we had, when you looked at the inlet setup, we had that exhaust vent on the back end is because when you're blowing through, you're blowing through at much, much greater rates than that. So basically the instrument takes its 25 mils a minute out of your gas flow or your breath flow and everything else is just sent to waste. So the actual flow into the instrument is constant as long as you have a constant pressure. So don't block up the other end and blow excess pressure in, but as long as you've got a constant pressure, we can tee off any excess flow and the instrument flow is always constant into the instrument. And that what leads to its inherent quantitation because we know things like the flow rate and we know what's going into the flow tube, we know what's coming out the back end of it. Brilliant, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mark. We we have an instrument here. We've got lots of different instruments here at Alstone and the, the SIFT MS has very quickly become a key workhorse in the research that we do here. So we can uh, thoroughly recommend it. Uh, from our perspective as well. But thanks again for the very interesting talk. Much appreciated. No problem. Thanks a lot. Cheers.